By the beginning of the year 45 BCE, Rome's dictator, consul, Pontifex Maximus, and fledgling authoritarian Julius Caesar received word that Rome's two Spanish provinces had fallen into enemy hands. The enemy was none other than Caesar's old right-hand man, Titus Labinus. Caesar and Labinus were exactly the same age, and may have known each other as far back as childhood, although this is impossible to prove definitively. By the time the two burst onto the political scene in the 60s BCE, they were already close friends and stalwart political allies. Caesar was always the most charismatic of the two, and when he was elected consul for the year 59, he helped Labinus get elected to the lesser office of preacher for the same year. When their terms were up, Caesar secured for himself a prestigious governorship, and as his first order of business, he asked Labinus to come along as his number two. Labinus accepted, even though he was qualified for a province in his own right. The two men spent the next decade bringing Gaul under the Roman yoke. This would forever be Caesar's greatest military achievement, and many would argue, in fact I think I would argue, that Labinus deserves at least 50% of the credit for this. When the Civil War kicked off, Labinus shocked everybody by siding with the Roman Senate. We don't have a clear picture of why he made this decision, but it appears to have come from a genuine place. Caesar extended many olive branches, but Labinus would slap down every offer. Over the next several years, Labinus became a zealous defender of Republican institutions. And now, after the deaths of Pompey and Cato and Scipio and countless others, Labinus was finally the leader of the Pompeian faction, or what was left of it. He knew exactly what to do. Unrest in the Spanish provinces meant that they still required a strong military presence, and many of these legions had spent some time on the Pompeian side of the civil war. As Caesar's legions back in Rome became rich beyond their wildest dreams, the Spanish legions became more and more unhappy. For Labinus, conditions were perfect. After joining forces with two of Pompey's sons, Labinus launched an attack on the Spanish provinces. Resistance was extremely light, and before too long, entire legions were coming over to Labinus's side in droves. Labinus then began to raise additional legions from local recruits, which proved to be extremely successful. According to estimates, Labinus raised something like 13 legions in basically no time at all. This was huge. It was more than Caesar faced at Pharsalus under Pompey, or at Thapsus under Scipio. But the more important fact is this. Caesar knew that unlike Pompey and Scipio, Labinus was his equal. His astounding momentum in Spain put the entire political order at risk. The stakes could not have been higher. Caesar had no choice but to intervene immediately. He left Lepidus, his new number two, in charge of the city of Rome, and departed with whatever legions happened to be nearby. Since he had just retired a massive number of soldiers, this worked out to approximately eight legions, a mere 60% of what Labinus had at his disposal. This was uh, not great, but time was of the essence and it would have to do. It's worth mentioning here that Caesar recruited as an aide-de-camp his late sister's grandson, the 17-year-old Gaius Octavius. The boy didn't really do anything on the campaign, but like I said, it's worth mentioning. There, I've mentioned it. Consider it mentioned. Before going any further, let me make it clear that this campaign is pretty badly sourced. The only contemporaneous account is anonymous and borderline unreadable. Historians have been able to piece together a plausible account of what happened, but be forewarned that the evidence for any of this is pretty thin. But nevertheless, here we go. Caesar and his eight legions set a breakneck pace and were able to make it to Spain in record time. When they arrived, Labinus and the Pompeians were in the middle of besieging one of Spain's last holdouts, the town of Iulia. As we know, Caesar was outnumbered. He didn't want to risk attacking an entrenched position if he could avoid it, so instead he marched on Cordoba, one of Spain's largest cities, hoping that the Pompeians would abandon their siege and give chase. The plan mostly worked. A small detachment stayed behind to continue the siege, but Labinus and the rest of the army moved to intercept Caesar. 
Labinus launched hit-and-run attacks, but Caesar refused to face his enemy head-on. The two sides slowly settled into a weird standoff. Caesar seized a few nearby towns for supplies, but other than that, nobody seemed too eager to initiate battle. Over the winter, the Pompeian army saw some defections. These were mostly from local Spanish soldiers, who were understandably more concerned with the fate of Spanish towns than they were with some Roman political dispute. Labinus sought to minimize future defections by pulling back to the town of Munda. From here, he would plan his next move. Labinus eventually decided that defections and the threat of future Caesarian reinforcements meant that a prolonged campaign was no longer in his interest. This cat and mouse stuff had to end. He found a good defensive hill near the town of Munda and planted his army there. Now all he had to do was trick Caesar into attacking. Caesar led his army to the town of Munda and approached Labinus's hill. For the first time, Caesar and Labinus faced each other as equals. The future of Rome hung in the balance. Caesar moved his cavalry to the left and his most experienced legions to the wings. Then, Caesar did exactly what Labinus wanted him to do. He attacked uphill. There were no clever tricks or maneuvers, just each side pushing against the other, sweating and bleeding and dying over every inch of ground gained or lost. It was muddy and brutal and exhausting, and it went on all day. As the sun approached the horizon, the two sides were basically at a stalemate. Perhaps Caesar expected Labinus's army to collapse within the first minutes of fighting. If so, that had been a mistake. The Caesarians were now fully committed, outnumbered and outpositioned. Caesar could see the writing on the wall. He jumped down off his horse, grabbed a sword and a shield, and charged the Pompeian line. He probably didn't actually see any combat, but that doesn't matter. The soldiers got the message. Win or lose, Caesar would share their fate. And then, on the Caesarian right, one of Caesar's veteran legions broke through the Pompeian line. Labinus personally took command of a legion that he had been holding in reserve, and charged Caesar's right. Equilibrium was restored. But then, Caesar's cavalry broke through on his left. Labinus was out of reserves. The cavalry swung around and encircled Labinus's position. The Pompeian army collapsed. Labinus was killed in the fighting. After the battle, Caesar ordered his soldiers to search the battlefield for Labinus's body. They found it. Caesar buried his old friend with full honors, in a field just outside the town of Munda. Caesar would later say that he had often fought for victory, but at Munda, he fought for his life. In the coming weeks, one of Pompey's sons would be captured and executed. The other son would evade capture for another decade, but it's safe to say that the Battle of Munda basically put the final nail into the Pompeian coffin. The civil war was over. For real this time. All of Caesar's rivals had been defeated. At this moment, he was perhaps the most powerful person on the planet. He would be dead in a year.